In the face of the series of significant economic shocks that have hit us in recent years, overall demand in the economy has proved resilient, supported by a very tight labour market. But there are increasing signs that higher interest rates are weighing on economic activity, and we see that in weaker official activity data and in a range of business surveys. Now, as we describe in some detail in today's report, the Monetary Policy Committee always takes a collective steer from a wide range of indicators to inform its view of labour market developments. And the overall message from these indicators is that, while it remains tight in an historical context, the labour market has loosened and by a little more than projected in August. Chart 3 shows how most indicators of employment growth are now easing. This includes the Purchasing Managers Index for Composite Employment Intentions, which is in light blue, and the Permanent Staff Placement Index, which is in dark orange. The official measure, which is in purple, has also weakened. But this last series can be volatile, and there are increased uncertainties around it following the suspension of the Labour Force Survey by the ONS. Now, to inform the MPC's assessment, bank staff feed all of these indicators into a model uh, to estimate a measure of underlying employment growth. This, this is a long-standing practice, but the challenges with the official data reaffirm the importance of taking such steers from quite a wide range of data sources. Now, the model-based estimate is shown in chart four in blue, along with the official data in orange. As you can see, the estimated measure for employment growth has gradually slowed since 2021, cutting through the volatility in the official data. The indicator-based model suggests that employment will be broadly flat over the second half of this year. There are other signs that the labour market is loosening. The number of vacancies has fallen and unemployment has ticked up. Now, despite this softening in the labour market, nominal wage growth remains much higher than would be consistent with the inflation target, if sustained at these rates. The ONS measure of annual growth in regular average weekly earnings in the private sector was 8.0% in August, higher than expected. The continued strength in wage growth has persuaded the MPC to raise slightly its assessment of the medium-term equilibrium rate of unemployment and also its estimate of persistence in wage and price inflation. In effect, the MPC judges that the weakening in the labour market has been driven in part by a lower supply of labour, not just demand. This would help to explain the continued strength in pay growth, even as employment growth has eased. While all measures of current pay growth remain elevated, the recent pickup in the official measure of private sector wages has not been matched by other indicators. This is illustrated in chart five. The bank's decision maker panel in yellow, HMRC payroll data in dark orange, and the Indeed wage tracker in purple all point to wage growth close to 7%, which is below the official data which were in blue. And the bank's agents continue to report that average annual pay settlements have been in the region of 6 to 6.5%. That is why, when assessing the evidence of inflation persistence, the MPC will continue to monitor all available data on pay growth very carefully. Weaker demand and a softer labour market are signs that monetary policy is restrictive. The effects of higher interest rates continue to weigh on economic activity, throughout the forecast we have presented today. Chart six shows the MPC's projection for growth in the UK economy, conditional on market interest rates. GDP is projected to remain broadly flat through 2024. Growth then recovers over the second half of the forecast period. It remains below historical averages, however, reflecting both restrictive monetary policy and subdued potential supply growth. On balance, the margin of excess demand has diminished over recent quarters, and we expect an increasing degree of economic slack to emerge from the start of next year. This will help to reduce inflation pressures in the UK economy, alongside declining external cost pressures. Chart 7 shows the implications for consumer price inflation. 
In the MPC central projection, which is conditional on the market path for interest rates, inflation is more likely to end the forecast below the 2% target than above it, albeit only slightly. In the modal or most likely case, inflation is 1.9% in two years' time and ends the forecast at 1.5% in the fourth quarter of 2026. The committee continues to judge, however, that risks around that central case are skewed towards higher inflation. Adjusting the modal projection for the balance of risk, the mean or expected path for inflation, is just above the 2% target in two years' time and just below it towards the end of the three-year forecast period. Now, the MPC's alternative projection, conditioned on a constant level of bank rate at 5.25% over the forecast period, has CPI inflation somewhat lower than the projection conditioned on the market path, especially towards the end of the forecast period. In the mean forecast, inflation is expected to be right at the 2% target in two years' time, rather than slightly above it, and then fall to 1.6% rather than 1.9% at the end of the forecast period. This is because the market path begins to decline gradually from the current level of bank rate towards the end of next year, so that the constant put rate path is above the market path in the final two years of the forecast. Monetary policy is currently restrictive in the sense that if we maintain this stance for long enough, we will squeeze inflation out of the system. And that's what we will do. This also means being on watch for further signs of inflation persistence that may require interest rates to rise again. But we should not keep monetary policy restrictive for excessively long. We have to be mindful of the balance of risks between doing too little and doing too much. How long a restrictive stance will be needed will ultimately depend on what the incoming data tell us about the outlook for inflation over the medium term. The MPC's latest projections indicate that monetary policy is likely to need to be restrictive for quite some time yet. And returning inflation to the 2% target remains our absolute priority. So with that, Ben, Dave and I will be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Um, usual process, please. Just try and limit yourself to one question each and let me know where you are from when you get a hold of the microphone. Uh, we will start with Faisal and then we will go to Sam. Thanks, Governor. Faisal Islam, BBC News. Um, so you're just about not predicting a, a recession, but stagnation for a, a year, a year and a half. If there was a recession, would that change your view that rates should stay roughly where they are for an extended period of time? Well, thanks, Faisal. I mean, I, it must be very clear. I mean, our objective is price stability, and price stability is defined as the inflation target. So that is our objective. Um, you know, we don't set out to project growth one way or the other. You're right in your description of it. It is subdued. Um, we see the evidence that uh, monetary policy and the rate rises that we have done are now having an effect. They are restrictive, and we think that is coming through in the profile of growth. And just to remind, we are still at 6.7% in terms of inflation, so there's, you know, there is a considerable way to go. We are determined to take, you know, to take it all the way back to target. There must be no doubt about that. Um, so that is, you know, that is what conditions our view of growth. But Ben, did you want to come in? No, I mean, I <clears throat> happen to think having this very rigid definition of what is a recession and what isn't is a bit odd. I mean, there's a continuum of outcomes. So whether or not it happens to be fractionally negative or fractionally positive, won't have a bearing on monetary policy. As Andrew says, our focus is inflation. The outcome for growth might have some impact on that, but I think you know, it's not as if zero is some crucial threshold for us. Sam in the middle there. Thanks, Sam Fleming from the FT. I mean, you're obviously at pains to stress the continued willingness of the MPC to lift rates again, but it does seem quite jarring when set against the increasingly down, downbeat outlook for economic activity, softening labour market, uh, and increasing slack in the new year. So is it not much more likely that the next move will be down rather than up? Uh, and what kind of conditions would you need to see specifically in order to merit uh, a downward move um, in, uh, in, well, in interest rates? I'll say two rates? things to start off, Sam, on that. Um, we have actually, as we've set out in the report, assessed that the risk to inflation 
remains remains in our view on the upside. So in a sense, that conditions our view of, of you know of the path of rates. Of course, I, th I think there are a number of things um, that under well there are a number of things that underlie that judgment on the risk. Although we actually take it at the sort of the top down level, we don't build it up from below. But we do focus quite a lot, obviously, on what stories underlie that. And I would I would point to, to two. One of which is is continuing, which is. Tightness, tightness of the labour market, the evidence we see on pay, the evidence, as you saw in the chart, on services inflation. These are the indicators that we've been pointing to for some time. And although I did point to what I would call you know, some of the puzzles around the pay data, I would still say whichever number you take from that chart, I mean, it, it is still inconsistent with uh, meeting the inflation target. We do think it's going to come down. But we've been surprised. The second thing I would say, and this is the new thing, I mean, I, I'm, I'm merely going to say that I think, you know, obviously the events in the Middle East are tragic in terms of the human, human cost. We have to view it through the economic lens. It does create uncertainty. It does, I think, create a risk of higher, higher energy prices. So far, I would say that hasn't happened, and that's, um, that's obviously encouraging, but the risk remains there. So I would point to, to those, those two things. In terms of your Second part of your question on what you know, what does it take? I mean, I would really just point again to the message that I think I made a number of times, but I, it's a very important one, which is um, yeah, we have got to see inflation coming down to target. There's no question. We've made very good progress. Um, I don't want to deny that. As I pointed out, I think there is quite a bit more to come this year, but we've got to see it going back down to 2%. And can I just add Dave, yes. one point to that, which I mean, it goes back to the first chart that Andrew put up the contributions to inflation. And you can see now that the major contribution to inflation now and in the coming months is from services inflation. And you know, that, that reinforces our concerns around the persistence of inflation. We do think that that will start to come off next year, but that has been a very sticky element mm. in inflation through this year, hence where our our bias still lies in terms of where the next rate move might come from. Can we go to Maureen and then Ed, please? Hello, um, Maureen Khan from The Times. Um, given the small discrepancy on the inflation path between what is the market rate and the, and the constant rate, is your message essentially to financial markets that you see no reason to cut interest rates in 2024, given the path for inflation? Well, the, the message is that we're going to have to maintain policy in a, in a restrictive stance as it is in order to see this, you know, the seeds see get all the way back down to target. I, I mean, I think it's helpful to use um, both the market rates path and the constant rate path to, in a sense, illustrate, you know, where we think, where we think they lead to in terms of the inflation target. Now, in fact, yeah, they, they both lead, of course, back to target. Let's be clear on that. Uh, there are some slight differences in terms of timing, but they both lead back to target. Um, but I, I want to just re-emphasize this message that we are going to have to maintain restrictive policy in order to get back to target, to take us back there. Uh, and we've got a distance to travel yet. That's the key message. I, think we want to... no, I, think so. I mean, I think there's any particular message we're trying to send financial markets. As Andrew says, the differences in the forecast are not huge. The forecast conditioned on constant rates dips slightly below the target. So maybe you think, you know, we won't have to hold this for three years, given everything else we have in the forecast. Um, equally, uh, when we condition on the market path, which has cuts appearing um, by the sort of last part, I think I can't remember exactly what it is, three or four months of next year, Inflation is still marginally above the target. I don't think there's any particular message we're trying to send with that. And indeed, I've been checking my emails while we've been speaking, and nothing much has happened to um, prices in financial markets since we've published this forecast. Um, I mean, the main message, as Andrew says, is a broader one, which is that we think policy has to remain restrictive for quite some time. I mean, if it helps just to illustrate it, um, if you take the, we, we use a 15 day window averaging for the, for the market rate, uh, of all market rates. And if you take that window period that we used and you calculate the average market rate over the next three years, so through the forecast period, and you compare it with the constant rate, it's about a quarter percent different. The constant rate is on about a quarter percent higher. Ed. Uh, thank you, yeah, Governor. Uh, Ed Conway from Sky News. Just looking at your forecast, I mean, 
it's basically flat, flat in terms of, of economic growth, certainly very weak, maybe not a recession, but basically flatlining, unemployment on the way up, quite a lot of pain that's being felt out there by households around the country. Can you say how much of that pain is, is down to what the bank has done, so down to interest rate policy? And would you say that that pain is a price worth paying to bring inflation down? Well, there's a long history to the price worth paying comment, and I'm not going to join that history, so I, I don't think that's the right language to use. I, I will go back to, to something I've said at a lot of, I know at a lot of these press conferences over the last few years, and I'm going to say it again. Um, if we don't get inflation down, then the pain is worse. And moreover, as I've said a lot of times, and I'll, I will say it again, you know, when inflation, is partic all inflation hurts, hurts the least well off, the hardest. When it's concentrated in energy and food, the essentials of life, it's even harder. And it's, it, it's critical that uh, you know, we bring inflation down. I think we're seeing you know, encouraging progress, but we've got to see this through. Uh, and that's what underlies. Now, you know, let me say two things on the, on, on the growth uh, projection. Yes, as I said earlier, I do think that you know, this projection reflects the fact that policy is restrictive. I, think, I mean, it's one of the things that we've spent quite a lot of time as a committee discussing, uh, and we do see the evidence to support that. The, the second thing I'll say is that I think, coming back to inflation and coming back to price stability for a moment, you know, achieving price stability and maintaining it is the best platform, particularly for a sustained growth on the supply side of the economy, to encourage investment. Um, and, and, and that's clearly what, yeah, what is important. Yeah, no, I agree with all that. The one thing that comes across from these forecasts, and in particular from the change since August, is that we've taken a more pessimistic view of the supply side of the economy. And that's partly because of what we've seen on the nominal side. You know, through the year we've inferred I mean, from actual productivity growth, from actual GDP growth, but still stubborn inflation, that at least for the time being, effective supply growth isn't that strong. And I think that those projections for actual growth next year should be seen in that context. Let's go to Joel and then Jamana. Uh, Joel Hills from ITV News. Uh, Governor, uh, millions of our viewers uh, have mortgage bills that they uh, need to pay. And when you say that interest rates are restrictive and are likely to be for quite some time to come, inevitably, people are going to be worried about that. Um, how restrictive are interest rates? Where's neutral? Put another way, when these temporary shocks are finally over, where are interest rates likely to settle? And if you want to give a range, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a version of the question you asked at the last yeah. press conference, but we'll have a go. Um, I, I'm going to say Ben will be... It's a reasonable question. It's a reasonable question. <laughs> um, I'm sure Ben will be delighted to join in. Um, let me start with... Well, let me say um, a couple of things. First of all, as a committee, we actually don't spend time discussing what we think the equilibrium rate of interest is because it is really too uncertain a concept. Um, it, 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 it is true, of course, that it sort of underpins the system, but as a guide to policy setting... Um, I, you know, I don't think it's a, uh, I don't think it's a helpful way to go about it. The second thing I would say, just on, let me just say one thing on mortgage rates. I mean, the, the rates on new mortgages have been falling a little bit gradually since about July, I think I'm right in saying, and that's because, of course, we've actually come off uh, the peak of expected rates as that, uh, over the next sort of few years has come down, um, uh, reflecting the fact that, of course, we've we've had rates on hold since August, so. You know, the path of expected interest rates has changed quite a bit, and that has actually reduced the path of mortgage rates. But ben, do you want to? Yeah. Um, well, as we discussed three months ago, Joel, it's very difficult to assess these things sort of in real time, and I generally think one finds out only after the event really what the neutral um, rate is. In saying it's restrictive, in saying that policy is restrictive, we think we're above that rate. But we've inferred that from what we've seen as happening to the real economy and some of the more, you know, the, the stuff that determines inflation over the medium term. Just to follow up, shortly after that press conference three months ago, there was a blog published on the, which I can send you if you want, on the I think New York Fed website. And it had in it a graph with two different estimates from two different models of trying to 
get at what the long-run neutral real rate of interest is, they happen to track each other in broad terms reasonably closely over 50, 60 years. You get to the last three years and one does that and one does that. And that, for me, illustrates the uncertainty we're talking about. And it's, you know, so we, we are confident enough to say we think we're above this rate, but I think it would be misleading, given the imprecision of these estimates, certainly in real time, to give you some number where we think we're definitely going back to in three, four years. I just don't think it would, would help. Um, and you know, we're following policy in response to data, and then we might look back over time and say such and such a thing has happened to the neutral rate of interest. I, I just think that people can understand that there's huge amounts of uh, well, their, their press conference from the Bank of England following their decision announced that mid-day to hold interest rates at 5.25% and also, more significantly perhaps, their announcement that they think that the British economy is going to be flatlining for the foreseeable future, not predicting any economic growth. Or Where I describe we are. And, you know, we certainly need to have it in restrictive territory because, as the Governor said earlier, actually what is most important for households in the long run is that we have inflation stable around the target. That's the most important thing. And if I can just come back to the, the context of your question, Joel, um, just to reiterate Andrew's point, and we put this in chart 2.6 of the monetary policy report, but mortgage rates on the most popular mortgage products have come off in the last few months, reflecting the fact that reference rates um, in markets have fallen back somewhat. But you're also seeing on the, on the other side of the ledger with saving rates, you know, longer term um, term deposit rates have continued to track those reference rates. But also, as we flag in chart 2.6, you're beginning to see instant access deposits, uh, you know, the rates that you get on your instant access accounts rising. So that's the, the, you know, the other part of the transmission mechanism, as it were, where the story has changed somewhat since since we were last here and that may be linked also to the fca's action plan on cash savings which means that the pass through um particularly on those instant access deposits seems to be picking up Joanna versace from cnbc um so i've noticed a new line in the statement i'm just going to read it out the mpcs can you hear me yeah. yeah, okay. The MPC's latest projections indicate that monetary policy is likely to need to be restrictive for an extended period of time. Can I just ask you why you felt the need to include that statement? What, why did you feel the need to include that statement? Especially given that markets are only pricing in the first rate cut for August of next year, August 2024. Are you trying to push back against that pricing? Thank you. No, we're not trying to, just to be very clear, it's a, it's, a, it's a very good question. We're not trying to move the curve around. I mean, that's not, not, our, not, a, not our role at all, and it's not what we're trying to do. Um, we're really just trying to emphasize this point that you know, we are not, you know, we're not talking about cutting interest rates. There's been no discussion in the committee about cutting interest rates. We think that interest rates will have to, you know, other, other things equal, we think that interest rates will have to remain where they are uh, for, an, for an extended period of time to get inflation back to target. That's simply the judgment. It's not a question of calling into question where, where the market is setting the curve. And, and in that sentence that you read out, and you're right, it is a new mm. sentence, it is framed by our latest projections. So it's not in any sense a promise. It's conditional on the forecast. But given the forecast that we've, been pub you know, that we've put together this time round... Uh, we thought it important to stress that extended period of, of rates staying in restrictive territory. And I would emphasise this point again that we were talking about just a few minutes ago, that when you look at the two different paths of rates, you look at the market path and you look at the constant rate uh, path, yeah, they deliver pretty similar, actually, inflation projections. Now, a good, and a, a good part of that, it's worth looking at sort of the path because... You know, as you get a little bit further out in the forecast, actually inflation is pretty flat around, you know, around the target for a period of time. It, it, it dips down below the target, but it's actually pretty flat just, you know, just around the target for some time. So that, again, helps to explain the different paths of, you know, different paths of rate. These different paths of rates are delivering pretty similar projections, actually. 
Larry and then Sue. Larry Elliott of The Guardian. You've painted quite a sort of grim picture of the economy. Um, inflation still high uh, and the economy weakening and monetary policy working. Given that the bank thinks it takes 18 months, up to 18 months, for the full impact of previous interest rate increases to have an effect, and only 50% of that impact has so far been felt, isn't there a danger of monetary policy becoming too reactive rather than predictive? and of policy falling at the MPC falling behind the curve here? Well, what we do, Larry, and, and by the way, we've included a lot more in the uh, monetary policy report this time about what we think is the transmission of, of, of interest rates and of, of the rate rises that we've done to date. And our staff have done a, a, a very large amount of work over recent months to, uh, to assist the committee in its thinking on that. And, and the point I'd, I'd, I'd really make is, of course, all of that is factored into the forecast. So the forecast, you, you're right to make this point that yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of uncertainty around it, I should say. But this, you know, according to the work done by the staff, you know, maybe we're approaching sort of halfway in terms of the impact of the transmission of uh, what's been done so far. I think, I think another point that is made is that within that, we may be at about the peak point in terms of the sort of the path of that impact. Those two statements are quite consistent, by the way. Um, it is uncertain, but we do factor all of that into our view. So the projection you've got factors all that in. Do you want to? Yeah, I mean, can I just make a slightly more general point, which is that we often talk here in this ordinance about the central forecast and that being the determinant of you know, the appropriate policy as judged by the MPC. Whereas, in fact, often one feels that you're trying to balance risks either side and you're trying to get to a point where roughly you've got 50% chance of being wrong on this side and wrong on the other side. And um, you know, there is a case where these nominal variables, wage growth and services prices, remain more persistent than we've allowed for even in this forecast. But what you've described very coherently is the opposite case, that in responding to these things which traditionally, at least, in more normal times, if you can call them those, would have been seen as late cycle indicators. There's a risk that we've over-tightened or will do so. And clearly that exists. But there are risks on both sides, and when we come to the view of the appropriate policy, we're trying to balance those. It would be wrong to pretend that they didn't exist, is my point. See you in the middle. Well, I would describe that I described the growth projection as certainly subdued, um, and I would pick out elements both on the demand side and the supply side. Now, on the demand side, I, I think I'd reiterate something that we've said at these press conferences before. Actually, of course, the economy has been res you know, resilient and been more resilient than we expected over recent times. But just to come back to this sort of critical point. We are now seeing you know, the, the effect of this restrictive policy coming through. So we've actually revised down our view of, the, of, of that sort of demand resilience in this forecast relative to where we, where we were in August. And then I think the second thing is to is, is go to the supply side of the economy. And we have taken a view uh, on that as well. We've revised up the medium-term equilibrium unemployment rate somewhat. Now, I would point to two things there. One is the fact that um, whichever indicator you look at on that uh, rather sort of busy chart, there was quite a few busy charts I showed, but that busy chart I showed, you know, even if earnings are a bit below where the average, the AWE, the average weekly earnings series says they are, they're still at seven, but you, know, you, you only get to seven from eight. I mean, it's still, they're still too high. So we are seeing, uh, you know, more resilient earnings uh, than um, we would have expected. And that has prompted us to look at the question of labour supply. Second thing I would quote on, on labour supply is, is that we've also seen uh, from work we've done, done quite continuously now for about a year or so, 
the, what we call the sort of the matching efficiency in the labour market. In other words, the, you know, the, the efficiency with which people are matched to jobs seems to have gone down. Um, and that, it, it, that too is causing a restriction on the supply side. So those, those two things, I mean, there's both demand effects and supply effects. Oh, oh I was going to, okay, you're going to ask. Sorry, I was just going to, I mean, you're in, in, by flagging, you know, relatively subdued real household income growth, growth as well, you're getting to the core of the issue, which if you want sustained rises in living standards, that comes through high productivity growth. That's not something, you know, that's the, the, the key driver on the supply side. That's, that's, as Andrew says, what we were saying earlier, what we can do in terms of getting inflation back to target is a kind of necessary condition for sustained uh, growth, but it's not sufficient. You need that productivity growth. That's been very weak in the recent period in the UK, that's a real focus for, rightly, for this government's policy, has been for previous government's policies. But that's the, that's the key underpinning for sustained non-inflationary rises in growth. No, I was going to say, I mean, I, you know, when you say people were used to two or over two, actually, we haven't had that for quite a while, right? Because of, we had did do before the financial crisis. A, productivity growth was stronger. B, we had big improvements in the terms of trade and import prices were falling and so forth. Those days, you know, sadly, we hadn't had them since the crisis. So real household income growth was, I think, a little over 1%, maybe one and a quarter or something for the decade after that crisis. So I don't think what we're predicting in those terms, I mean, there's no doubt what it's weaker during this period of slightly below trend growth, but our underlying this are sort of long-run supply-side assumptions are actually not terribly different from those we experienced in the decade after the financial crisis. Lucy and then Ashley, please. Right behind you. Um, Governor, we've seen something of a disaster at the Office for National Statistics over the last um, month in the delay of the labour market uh, data. Um, given the emphasis that you have placed on aspects like pay growth and um, employment growth, what effect has this had on your forecasts? And, and do you think essentially you are flying blind a little bit? And if we do see the Office for National Statistics improve its... Um, data collection as it's hoping to by December. What change is this going to have? Are you going to be able to place more emphasis on that data? Um, what change will it have to your approach? Well, I'll start. I mean, Ben's been um, very, very close to what's going on. I should say you may have seen that the ONS has put out a, quite an action plan this morning, so I would obviously you know, encourage, encourage to, to, to look at that. I, I, I was slightly at pains in my introductory remarks um, to, to make the point that we, and, and this is not new, um, we look at what you might call a sort of a, you know, a suite of data that, uh, in a sense, give us, I think, together uh, you know, a pretty good read on, uh, on, on, on the state of the labour market in terms of employment and unemployment, particularly employment. And, and that's because we've, I mean, we've seen for some time that the um, response rate in the labour market uh, for the force survey has, has been coming down. Uh, and, and just to sort of reiterate that, of course, the, the ONS had to switch from a um, you know, in-person style of interviewing to obviously to telephone interviewing during COVID. Uh, and it appears that the response rate to the telephone interviewing has, has come down further, and the ONS have, have called it out and said, you know, this is, this is you know, no longer representative necessarily. But on your flying blind point, I, you know, I would say that's why I was quite at pains to point out that for some time we've been, um, you know, we've been looking at a suite of indicators because we think it gives us a better read. And I, and I would just emphasise, I mean, the, 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 the second of those two charts I showed, I mean, what you might... You, you see in there is that is that the the official measure has been quite volatile in the short term. That that I think it was the orange line, if I remember rightly. But if it was the other line, I apologise. Uh, and and you know the one that we generate from our, our suite actually is a, is a smoother a smoother but not inconsistent line. I don't, they're not telling particularly different stories actually. 
Uh, and that's relevant as well, because obviously the volatility uh, you know, is not something that we would want to just copy across into our view of the economy. But Ben, you've been close to it. Yeah, just a couple of things. I mean, first of all, the UK is not alone in having this yeah. difficulty with falling response rates for household surveys in particular. They've probably fallen more steeply here in the last couple of years. Um, and we welcome the action plan the ONS has to reinstitute the LFS, publish it again, hopefully in, in December. Um, and of course, we have a wholly new survey to look forward to sometime next spring, we're not sure exactly when, um, which has been in preparation for quite some time. The, as, as Andrew said, certainly on the employment side, I don't think we, that the committee will be missing that much, frankly, in the intervening two or three months. Well, we've only got one month now, but two or three months worth of data. We've always run these models of what's actually going on with employment from surveys. We have quite a lot of them. Um, we have a pretty good read from those. Um, and I, I think we can come to a reasonably good view of employment growth uh, from those sorts of statistical models. The split of the rest, the split of non-employment between inactivity and unemployment is somewhat harder. Um, and we have fewer sources of information, but we do have the claimant count. And so long as the um, you know, requirements needed to claim benefit don't change, over short periods of time, that does give you some information. So I, I wouldn't say that you know, we have none. I think we have a, a reasonable handle in the, on the interim, but obviously we look forward to the um, improvements and the um, restarting of the LFS, hopefully at the end of this year, and then to the um, replacement survey, for which response rates are a good deal, response rates are a good deal higher uh, sometime next year. Hi. Um, thank you, Governor. Ashley Armstrong from The Sun. Um, I just wanted to ask, staying on jobs, um, the recent insolvency figures have shown that you know, kind of, uh, access to lending and difficult to raise, uh, raise lending is one of the biggest rises uh, for going, companies going bust. So I just wondered how that fed into the unemployment figures as well as a result of companies going bust. And then secondly, on the energy costs coming down in, in, in your forecast, you know, it's, it's uh, nice to see that we kind of don't have such an extraordinary energy cost, but given how volatile and how unpredictable it is, and with the conflict going on in Israel and Gaza, I mean, how confident can you be in, in, in putting that kind of estimation that energy costs aren't going to be such a big driver of inflation in the year to come? No, so it's very good. thank you. Very good question. So, just on insolvencies, I mean, again, it's another piece of evidence that we can sort of, in a sense, take into account. And it, 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 you're, you're right. I mean, it obviously, look, none of us, are, none of us are seeking to have insolvencies. Let me be clear. But it's another piece of evidence that supports this sort of assessment of, of, of how policy is operating, and it tends to sort of, un, 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 you know, underline this judgment on the restrictiveness of policy on energy costs. Um, I mean, you're right, obviously, about the short-term the short profile of energy costs. Just to reiterate, we expect quite a sharp drop in the next reading of the reading of inflation, for the, which is actually for October, published in a couple of weeks' time, because of the way in which the off-gem uh, methodology adjusts. And, of course, it adjusts basically quarterly, so we do get these quite discrete movements. I mean, going as, as I said in my remarks, I mean, obviously, you know, from a human level, these are, these are tragic events that we're seeing around us. Um, uh, I, I'll just reiterate two points I made. First of all, actually, it, you know, we have not seen, actually, large movements in energy prices in the uh, period since the, these tragic events um, started. However, um, you're right that the risk is obviously... Um, is obviously there, and it is one of the things that we factored in when we were thinking about the risks to inflation. Um, so although it's not in the path of energy prices, and we do use market, market futures paths to, 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 sh to shape those paths, when we come to think about the risks, we take a much broader view. Um, and so that risk, yes, I would say that risk has increased over the, uh, over the period since we last, uh, last did the forecast. John Paul, and then you should... Uh, 
Thank you. John Paul Ford, Rochester from the Daily Mail. Um, from something, just want to clarify something that was said a little bit earlier about um, the risk of GDP growth falling to uh, at or around zero and, and the idea that you're not necessarily that worried about, about whether it's slightly above or slightly below zero. Um, it sounds like from that that the bank is prepared to tolerate um, a, a, mild, a mild recession, even if it is a technical or, or, or very, very small one around that zero level. Um, can you clarify whether that's, whether that's the case? Um, and, and does that mean that we're in for a sort of a bumpy landing, I suppose, given the projections that are quite weak? Um, if I may just ask one other further um, question as well about your predecessor, Mr. Bailey, Mark Carney, who offered his backing to uh, Rachel Reeves. Um, did he tell you about that? Is that appropriate? And would you personally ever consider um, notionally in the future doing anything like that yourself? Well, let me start with that question. I, I might, ben might come in on the, on the um, GDP question. Um, the bank is independent and, and apolitical, uh, and that is absolutely at the core of this institution. So let me be clear on that. Obviously, former governors can you know, make, that, make their own decisions. They're not part of the institution uh, any longer. And Mark, Mark did not tell me in advance, and of course, he, there's no reason why he should. He has no obligation to. Uh, tell me that, so I, I did not know in advance. Uh, and really, that, that's the key thing. Uh, I'm not, um, I have to tell you, at the stage of contemplating uh, life thereafter, but I just want to absolutely emphasize, because just emphasize it is at the core of this institution. And, and I will tell you honestly, it's the core of me personally as well. I am apolitical and we are independent in, in respect of the, of, of the functions we perform. And that is absolutely central to us. Sorry for the sermon, but it's really, it's a very good, it's an important question, and yeah, yeah stay clear. Um, what I was saying earlier is that there's, there's no sort of threshold at which suddenly weaker growth below that is very important and stronger growth above it equally. So what matters is you know, what it does to the prospects for inflation. So all else equal, if growth weakens and then there's more slack in the economy, that puts downward pressure on growth of wages and prices, it would have implications for policy. Um, so one shouldn't pretend it's irrelevant. It's just that there's no threshold effect where suddenly, you know, growth below that is crucial. Uh, it's a continuum. So... You know, if, if you look at the things that we've stressed as being important for the stance of policy, they are things that follow maybe from demand growth. Uh, the degree of slack in the labor market and their growth in domestic inflationary things like wages and services prices. Hi, um, Isha Nelson from the New York Times. You, can I just ask you to go back to your point about the extended period of time that inflation um, interest rates need to be at restrictive levels? Market pricing isn't suggesting a cut until the second half of next year. Is it that market pricing you're pushing against, or is it a message for some other actors in the economy? And then secondly, you focused on the impact of energy prices from the conflict in the Middle East and that potential. Are there other ways in which you think the UK economy is vulnerable to uh, that conflict or that conflict spreading further? And also, do you think that if energy prices were to jump higher, the response would be different or, this, or the same? You know, how would the economy res inflation respond to a sharp increase in energy prices? Do you feel that actually it could be transitory like the belief was last time? Or given the experience of the last couple of years, you would lean much more heavily on higher interest rates much more quickly? Thank you. Well, just going back to the first question, I think I'd sort of re-emphasize what I said um, to an earlier question, which is we are not trying to lean against the curve in any sense. I mean, we, yeah, we don't do that. Um, so, yeah, we've used that language, and it is very deliberate, as, as, as Dave said earlier. I mean, it, it was a, it was a very deliberate language, obviously. Uh, but it's not deliberate to lean against the curve. It's really deliberate to just make the point that although, uh, you know, encouragingly inflation is coming down and we expect it to come down further, there is still, you know, very, very considerable way to go. And we're going to you know, be there 
uh, to take it down to 2%. That's the message. It's not a, it's not a message about the curve. That sense. And, and just to reiterate the points, I mean, you know, these forecasts, as you, we, we, we've presented, you know, the variant forecast, the variant in the forecast with the constant rate curve, they don't actually make that much difference. So we're, we're not making a point about the curve in that sense because the differences are pretty small. On energy prices, I mean, I, I, you know, Ben or David want to come in. I mean, I'll, I'll just say, I think, look, I think in this conflict, it, it is obviously natural to look at energy prices because obviously if there is a regional element to this conflict, then that is the thing you would naturally look at. Um, it's a bit different from that, that in that respect than Ukraine, say, where obviously there was a very big impact in, in food prices as well, for instance. Look, we would have to judge the thing. Um, you use the word transient, which you, um, obviously is, a, is an interesting word for central banks these days. Of course, the, the origin of that phrase is, is simply this, that, that a single supply shock of, you know, of that nature, you have to judge both the impact and the expected duration. And, you know, if the duration isn't expected to be longer than the transmission of monetary policy, then you know, there is a case for accommodating it and then, and then reacting if you see second round effects or you, fear, you, know, you suspect or fear second round effects. The, the problem we have had in recent years, in my view, is not that that's, that's wrong. It's that we've had a, a succession of very big supply shocks with you know, no gaps between them. And, of course, the that just undermines the sort of this basis of, 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 of transience. I mean, I readily recognize that. So we would have to you know, make that assessment. I think you always also have to make the assessment of what, what are, goes back to what we've been talking about for much of this, this discussion, the, the impact on inflation and the impact on, on demand and activity in the economy, because those two things are both irrelevant, and we would have to make that judgment. Uh, that's right. I mean, it's, it is... In fact, as Andrew says, I mean, the last three years have been extraordinary, both the scale and the nature of the shocks. But in many ways, that simple orthodox response of, a, of any monetary policymaker would have to a change in energy prices, namely, um, you may react less for any given impact on inflation pending second round effects, quote, that's precisely what we've been doing. I mean, the shocks have been huge, and they've, they've multiplied each other, but that's essentially the message. So I don't think one can say, I mean, I, I would imagine we'd have the same approach, to be honest. Um, and we've, we've learned, certainly I've learned, that the, even given the huge scale of the shocks, the second round effects on domestic um, wage and price inflation have been stronger than I thought they would be. And that would be, therefore be a slightly more you know, uncertain judgment as to what they would be were this to reoccur. But in, in broad terms, the nature of the judgment is exactly as Andrew described it. Jeff and then Bill, please. Hello, thank you. Jeff, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Smith from Politico. Uh, and uh, apologies, I know this is a monetary policy press conference, but I wanted to change the subject very briefly. Um, with the latest amendment to the Financial Services and Markets Bill, you Could you talk a little louder? I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Apologies. <clears throat> with the latest amendment to the Financial Services and Markets Bill, you now have the right to change your funding model. Uh, and I wanted to ask you why you would want to do that and what you would, you know, what you would aim to achieve by so doing. And I think specifically I'd like you to specify what you, what you would expect the concrete impact are on the risk of or possibility of net transfers from the Treasury to be? Sure. Well, um, the bank's funding um, is quite complex because we have a number of different sorts of activities. Uh, some, of our, some of our activities are funded today by levy. All the, the PRA is, the regulation is funded that way. Some of them are funded because people pay us for the services we provide, and payments world. Um, in the case of banknotes, we deduct the cost of issuing them and then pay the so-called so seniorage over to the Treasury. And then you get back to the core of what we call the policy functions, of which, by the way, monetary policy is obviously part, but I mean not, not, not the only part. Historically, they've been paid for by what's called cash ratio deposits, which, which means that the banks maintain a certain level of, uh, of non-interest bearing deposits with us. Now, by the way, this is really, A, it's not a very big, it's not big in the grand scheme of things, and it's nothing to do with monetary policy. So this is not about monetary policy. 
and the yield on those deposits that we earn pays for the policy functions. The problem is that I, I, I would say if you're running a, you know, any sort of organization, um, obviously the, the yield that we earn on those, those deposits obviously varies with interest rates, um, you know, is not that predictable from year to year. Um, and um, from the point of view of running an organization, it's not the best way to frankly fund your activities. Um, you know, some, some, some years you may overfund and some years you underfund. Um, and so what the legislation, which you rightly point to, uh, envisages is that we will move to a, a levy-based system where we can essentially set a budget and raise a, raise a levy from the, uh, from, from, from the, essentially from the organisations we, we regulate to do that. Um, we're, I should say we're in the process of going through all the sort of practicalities of how to do that, um, and we'll be saying more about that, so I'm not going to sort of prejudge that. But it, it, it's really about having, frankly, a sort of predictable and fairly, what I would call more sort of sensible in the modern world budgeting system, ability to fund your budget. It's not more than that, really. And so what's the impact on, on the Treasury? Well, I mean, I, all I would add to what Andrew said is and, and you probably sense this, that the previous system was pretty opaque. Yes. This new system will be more transparent, and I think that that's, that's a good thing in terms of being clear what, you know, what, what we're spending money on on the policy function, how it's being funded. There is an interaction with the Treasury on that, but from our perspective, uh, you know, the way that this is being framed through the parliamentary process, this, this won't have any impact on what we want to do in terms of that policy no, function. It, it's not designed to have any impact on the Treasury. Um, it's not any, in any sense a sort of backdoor tax or anything like that. I mean, it is simply a way in which we cover part of the costs of this institution. Bill. Thank you, Bill Schomburg from Reuters. Um, changing the subject again a little bit, um, you mentioned earlier that there's been quite a lot going on in the, gil in the, in the gilts market, in the bond market. Um, there's been some speculation that the moves, especially at the long end of the market in the longer duration gilts, um, might lead to a slight rejigging of the operational um, system that you use for QT. It seems that uh, there's particularly sort of sharp price falls for longer end gilts. Is this something that you're considering? I know that in the past you've said you're open to looking at these things, but I think you've also said the bar is pretty high for any major changes. H have the moves in the market sort of led to new discussions, new thinking, and should we be expecting anything along those lines anytime soon? Uh, Dave, well, Dave's the uh, expert on this one. I mean, we, we, to, we, we're very open in the minutes uh, about drawing attention to these moves at the long end. They've obviously been from a not just for us, but for other monetary policy makers. They're, yeah, they're very relevant context it's in the sense that it's been a, that the rise in 10-year yields, 30-year yields, particularly in the US, has been a real feature between the September meeting and this one. How, in terms of um, thinking through, um, do, you know, do they change the context for our quantitative tightening operations not at all. Um, we were we're very keen, as we've stressed, uh, both the MPC has stressed and the bank has stressed in terms of the operation, that um, we want those those um, operations to be as predictable as possible, and that our, our approach to them, the principles that underline them, are based on that predictability. So. These moves in yield curves don't change that at all. We've set out our schedule of auctions for the rest of this year. You know, what sort of um, gilts we'll be selling and we'll be sticking absolutely to that. But back to the kind of bigger picture point, you know, the, the fact that long-term yields are going up and the drivers behind that, as we say in the minutes, you know, we, we it's clear that higher for longer is a message that um, um, has from from not just us but other policymakers has um, 
has been received by markets. There is also some speculation in markets, you know, particularly when you think about the US, but, but also potentially relevant to other countries, that R star, this equilibrium rate, uh, may have gone up. Um, but I mean, that's a, an open debate. But also that term <coughs> premia uh, have been driving some of the increases um, you know, term premium could be linked to greater uncertainty in the world, could be linked to greater supply of debt in various jurisdictions. I do want to just stress, though, though that we don't think that quantitative tightening is contributing significantly to those increases in term premium. I, I set the detail of that out in a speech back in July. So I hope that gives you some further background. Thanks. Last question. Go ahead, Richard. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Richard Partington from The Guardian. Um, I was going to ask, you know, if I'm viewing this correctly, there's a trade-off the bank has to manage here between the risks of recession uh, and ensuring inflation falls back to target to give the economy a more stable platform for the future. Um, so if no policy loosening from the central bank for an extended period, what about perhaps the fiscal stance, uh, perhaps tax cuts? I know that's not in your gift, but what would be the impact of tax cuts, fiscal loosening, be for the economy in the forecast? Well, first, I mean, in a sense, you've, you, you've, you've answered it in, in good part yourself. I mean, that's actually a matter for the government, not for the Bank of England. Um, we take, obviously, we condition all our forecasts on announced uh, fiscal policy. Uh, so this forecast is on is conditioned on the policy that has been announced up to up to now. It obviously doesn't take the um, the autumn statement into account because that's not uh, not happened yet. Um, and you know, whatever. Whatever were to be announced um, would be factored into our next forecast. I don't really think I can add much more than that. Um. Great. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you.